Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Paul Brown Show. This evening, my guest will be Mr. Fred Whitaker. He's a coach. He's a oh, he's out there in the boxing area. Oh, he's like so exciting. Welcome to the Paul Brown Show, Mr. Whitaker. Welcome, welcome. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Mr. Well, my name is Frederick Whitaker. And I'm originally from Wilmington, North Carolina. I started boxing when I was three years old, and I'm 54 now, so that was 48 years ago. I had the opportunity to see a lot of and do a lot of things in boxing. I trained with 13 world champions, Tim Witherspoon, Michael Dokes, David Bay, um, Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas. I was one of the guys helping Buster Douglas when he fought Mike Tyson. Um, I just talked to him night before last, and they're getting ready to do a movie on the Mike Tyson Buster Douglas fight. Okay. And um, they're saying they would like to bring me back to Columbus, Ohio, to put in my little two cent on what went on during the time that tra Buster was training for the Mike Tyson fight. When Buster Douglas' mom died, you know, we was there with him, and how we encouraged him to. When God takes something from you, he will give you something in return. And if you don't handle it in the right perspective, yeah. then he'll soon take that from you. But I just want to let you know and everybody else know that God has been very, very good to me in my life. And I'm proud to be here. And what I do with the kids, I train kids here in Winston-Salem. We have a boxing club called Yes We Can Boxing Health and Fitness. And we've been in existence now, going on 14 years, and we have a great, great support group with the mayor of Winston Salem, Miss Burns, who's on the mayor's first in charge, and we're just trying to do great things. Mm. Sound like you had an awesome life so far, sir. Tell us um, what inspired you to want to be a uh, deal with the boxing industry. Well, my father was a fighter, and he used to come and travel and do little matches and I used to travel along with him and as a young kid they'll put the little young kids in there for entertainment okay. and when I was like three and four and five years old they used to put gloves on me and somebody else and we'd be the entertainment during the breaks of the, um, during the boxing matches and it was it was awesome and therefore I just kept on doing it kept on doing it and I know in my lifetime I had over 300 and some amateur fights when I only lost maybe 28, 29 hmm. fights. And I enjoy it. And as a professional, it was even better than that because I had the opportunity to travel and see a lot of people. One of my goals was to meet Muhammad Ali. I met Muhammad Ali in 1974 in um, Frankfort, Kentucky. I was in the parade and I was in the bathroom and Somebody said, get out of my way. And I said, whoa. And I said, who are you talking to? And I looked up and it was Muhammad Ali. And he inspired me just to keep on doing what I was doing. And I was t hoping to one day be the heavyweight champion of the world. If not, my kids are. The kids that I have in the gym, they inspired me to be and to do the best that I can do and what they can do. And that's the box. Mm. How do you handle being with all these famous boxers in your past? And how did you know? How did you? How do you put that, up with that? Oh, God, I mean, the <laughs> boxers that you just named, from Muhammad Ali, the greatest, to some of the former champions. How have you? You know, how are you able to deal with that? Well, I still talk to some, some of the guys now. You take Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson, and Tim Witherspoon. I still have their name in my phone. I call them up at times. You know, we talk and laugh and grin about some of the things that we used to do in camp and some of the running and some of the sparring and everything. And it was wonderful. And it is great to knowing that I once in the past had an opportunity to be with these guys that I can still call them up now and they say, hey, Fred, what's up, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And you know, we talk and laugh and grin like we, you know, never missed each other, never been out of the, um, the line of each other. We still friends, we still communicate and I enjoy it and I love it. 
at what point in your boxing career did you realize, I mean, did you stand there at all and said, I'm really here? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, back in 19, um, say, uh, 84, I'm sitting in my room and um, I got a phone call. You know, it was Don King. And he said, yes, Frederick Whitaker, I had just finished fighting the Nationals in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I, and I said, yes, sir. And he said, um, I said, this is really Don King? He said, yeah, this is DK. And um, he said, um, I would like for you to come up to camp and work out with uh, Fredo Baneliski, the guy who just fought Ali um, a few years before. And I was like, okay. Uh, he said, because I may want to put you on the contract. I said, all right, I took that chance and I went to uh, Orwell, Ohio. And I started working out with um, this guy. Um, the first round, it was like in between, not, not sure whether I should hit this guy, rather, you know, not to get hit. And um, it went okay, but the second round, it was outstanding because after that, I got out of the ring and Don King said, um, would you like to sign a contract with me? And I said, okay, contract. I said, how many years? And he said, well, it can be until you're the heavyweight champion of the world. And I said, okay. I never reached that opportunity. I never got that high in the boxing rank of being the heavyweight champion of the world. But having the opportunity to work out with other heavyweight champions, mm -hmm. like I said, it was wonderful. Um, you take Afonso Ratliff, was the cruiserweight champion of the world. Ricky Parkey was the um, cruiserweight champion of the world. Bernard Benton was the cruiserweight champion of the world. I used to work out with them. And they inspired me to work harder. And anything that faces me, I tried to work hard in doing it and doing it great. Who inspired you? My father, Thero Millet from Wilmington, North Carolina. He was a great fighter. And you take Muhammad Ali and all these guys that I used to see on TV and sit down and dream. I used to like, Lord, one day I want to be this. I want to be that. But he gave me the opportunity to do it. And I never achieved that goal of being the heavyweight champion of the world, mm -hmm. but I'm a world's champion because I worked out with 13 world's champions. I helped guys defend their title. I helped guys to win titles. I didn't, I don't have the belt on. I never wore the belt, but I feel like a world champion because I helped them to achieve that goal, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, you take push, come to shove. I love doing what I do, and that's dealing with boxing and dealing with kids. And basically, it's only obesity part that I am more concerned about because our youth needs to be more in tune with itself by running, being in condition, yeah, the internet is good, YouTube is good, and I mean, all this stuff is great. But if you don't get the kids out there conditioning themselves, doing stuff in a repetitiously way to stay in shape, then you find these guys 13 years old weighing 250 pounds. And, you know, it's a big concern on that. And that's one of my pet peeves. I want to see all kids enjoying themselves, out running, doing, what it takes for them to stay in shape. How long have you had your program and what feeling do you get when you see yourself helping these youth stay out of the streets? Mm, hey, I've been doing this, like I said, um, for quite a while. And the interesting part about it, it is, I love it when kids come to me and they say, thank you, coach. And I say, well, thanks for what? I said, I'm just doing what I do. They say, well, you helped me and you built my courage up. Now, the guys that used to bully me and used to talk to me bad, I can face them knowing that I'm a boxer. But the point of them, me being a boxer, is knowing that they have enough confidence in themselves to get in the ring. You should have enough confidence in yourself where you can talk to anybody and talk to them in a respectful way and have them to talk to you in a respectful way. 
how do you do you get with the parents of the children? Do you, are you able to communicate with them and kind of find out more about the child outside of the your facility? Yes, and well, one of the th things I do is um, I have the kids to fill out a sheet, say, I like to box and who am I? And this on the sheet, it has um, maybe 30 or 40 questions asking the kids, you know, what is your likes? What are your dislikes? What is your goals? What, what are you looking to do in your life within 12 months? And I have the kids sit down and they tell me on this piece of paper what they want to do and what they have to do. I have a lot of AG students. Um, I have my AG students to deal with the kids that's not as educated as they are, you know, because the kids that's not as educated as the other kids are better boxers, but not all of them are better boxers, and they work together. You teach me how to read. I teach you how to jab and how to throw a right hand, how to move. I let the kids deal with each other. And I mean, you take the Hispanics, um, the, L, the Latinos, the MS 13s, all them guys. I have all them guys in my gym. And the communication that we have in the gym is that the youngest kid in the gym is in charge. Yes, and overall, I'm in charge, but they say yes, sir, and no, sir, to each other in the gym. It's not, hey, man, or hey, dude. It's not that. It's all about respect, because in the, in the ring, that's what you're looking for, respect. And you cannot get respect if you're not giving respect. And all the kids are on the same line of respect. You got to give it and enough to receive it. And pretty much that's how it is. How important is education to the kids and how do you express that in your work ethics? Mm. Okay, you take it where the education is the most important thing because I tell the kids, if you don't achieve your goal by boxing, using your hands, you'll be able to read. I don't want no one to receive a contract or do anything and not able to read about what they're going to do or how it's going to be done. If you sign a piece of paper stating that, yeah, I'm going to become the heavyweight champion of the world, I'm going to do this, here, I'm going to do this, and you sign it and you really don't understand what you're signing, you may be signing your life away. I want you to be able to read if you know achieve being the heavyweight champion or the lightweight champion of the world, be able to read. Because reading is very important from, from first grade to the second grade. I don't want no one else to take the advantage over any kid because I want that kid to be able to read about what they're signing and what they're doing. That's one of the goals that I teach the kids. Go to school. One of the goals is yeah. achieving being the, um, the smartest kid in school. If you're not the smartest kid in school, at least be able to read, at least be able to write, to understand what it is that can make you a movie up to another level in life. As far as a contract, what does that mean to that individual and why is it important that they make sure that they understand what they're signing? because that's one of the key things that you need to understand. Yeah. When yeah, I understand that. And I apologize if I, if I keep speaking to you in terms, but I, I just do that often. But the thing of it is, is the most important thing about education, you, you'll be